I guess I will go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to DiffBot's weekly webinar. Uh, I'm Merrill Cook, Content Marketing Manager at DiffBot, and today we're going to talk through competitor, vendor, and customer data from across the web. So we're talking about public web data here that's pulled into our knowledge graph. Uh, we're going to take a bit of a hands-on approach here, and I'll show some techniques that we see utilized to solid effect for market intelligence in our KG. Uh, I'll spend maybe the first five minutes talking about our knowledge graph and market intel in general, and then I'll dive into uh, the KG dashboard and demo a few things. So uh, to start, if you don't have a DiffBot trial or account and would like to follow along with the demo section, I'd encourage you to head to app.diffbot.com forward slash get started, and you can sign up for a free two-week trial, no credit card needed, no obligation there. Uh, and this intro section should take about five minutes if you'd care to do that now. So uh, to get moving, uh, let's just jump into a quick definition of market intelligence. Uh, everybody pro here probably knows this, but uh, sometimes it's good to start with a common definition. So market intelligence is comprised of many potential subtasks, types of research and analysis. that I've listed some of on the screen, but uh, essentially it's the process of analyzing data that pertains to customers, suppliers, distributors, regulatory agencies, and competitors, among other entities. It's essentially information on your market and the forces that drive change there. So where do we find market intel data? Um, if we think about where most of the clues or pieces of information about these market intel entities live these days, it's really the public web. And when we're performing market research manually, uh, pieces of market intelligence can be pretty much anything. Uh, it could be a new site redesign or logo where you can see a brand is repositioning itself. It can be press releases, financial filings, journalistic coverage, can be pricing data or pricing data by location, reviews, regulatory announcements, can be random social media mentions. Uh, so there are a ton of different signals that a human analyzing can definitely pick out some of these signals and make some inferences or pull out some hard facts. But Sort of the key here is that these pieces of data are all over the place. They aren't curated or interpreted by a human in a searchable format unless it's a brand that has analysts writing about its every move. Uh, and those pieces of information are spread across the web and in many different formats. So they aren't really that easy to extract at scale, uh, even if you're just looking at a few organizations. And the likelihood that manual data gathering is going to find all these long tail values uh, is pretty low. Uh, and so uh, this is where the knowledge graph graph comes into play. So a little bit of background. Uh, DiffBot is one of three North American entities who crawl the entire web. Uh, over the last decade and pre-knowledge graph, we honed a number of machine vision and NLP enabled web scrapers. Uh, they're what we call ruleless web scrapers uh, in that just like humans, they can pull data from pages that are slightly different. They don't rely on a rule tailored to a given site. And this makes them more resilient. They can pull, say, a price or product specs from a page that they've never seen before, as long as it has some of the hallmarks of a product page. Uh, and we have a range of these automatic extraction APIs for articles, videos, and products, events, discussions, and more. So. We built off of this technology and these basic ideas when we created the knowledge graph. We wanted something that with machine vision and NLP could lo locate details that matter on a page and pull them out. And for the knowledge graph, where the crawl is web scale, uh, how we organize this extracted data becomes a very important choice. Uh, so that really brings us to the knowledge graph today. So. At a basic level, the KG is a large number of entities, that is people, places, and things. These include or organizations, people, articles, products, intangibles, places, uh, creative works, among other types of things. And depending on the entity type, different facts matter. An organization may have a funding round, but a person may have a, an employment history fact. So. Hopefully you can start to see uh, some of the reasons why a KG, particularly a web sourced KG, is uniquely suited for market intelligence. But to uh, briefly list out some of these core reasons, uh, they include the fact that the schema for KG entities is flexible. It can take in facts or inferences of many types uh, that are pertinent to that given entity, and it can change over time as well. So 
that sort of fits well with the notion that market intelligence data can be in many forms, many locations, and uh, be comprised of many fact types. Uh, and yet these market intel clues still relate back to a single entity. Uh, so in the KG, they're structured and they're in a spot where you can find them and sort them uh, and filter them and so forth, rather than spread across the entire web. So secondly, KGs are linked data. Uh, basically, a knowledge graph is entities, also known as nodes and connections or relationships between the nodes called edges. So KGs are actually structured around the idea of connections. Um, there are some performance benefits to this compared to relational databases, but it's also just the type of information uh, that really matters in market intelligence. Uh, you know, things like uh, an organization hired 10 people and they have these three skills each, or uh, the sentiment of article entities that mention an organization has gone up and so has product entities linked to the org. Uh, maybe that's a pr pr successful product launch. Uh, but the linked nature between entity types loops back to the fact that this is how humans draw market research conclusions. Uh, we consolidate many sources of information, then we try to draw a conclusion or ask further questions. And then finally, knowledge graphs structure uh, web data and market intelligence happens in specific environments. It happens in Jupyter Notebooks and Power BI and Google Sheets, many other locations. So the fact that knowledge graphs provide uh, structured data uh, or just straight up integrations uh, makes it so that not only do, is it data that lends itself to market intel research, but the structure is compatible with where market intel research happens. Um, but yeah, if you haven't played around with the knowledge graph, maybe this is a little too high level, not specific enough. So really the way to see the range of valuable data from market intel research um, uh, is just to jump right in. So that's what I was planning on next, uh, jumping into uh, the knowledge graph. Um, it's a great place to perform market research entirely or just do exploratory research. Uh, we obviously have API access as well as integrations. So you can pull this data into the places you like to work, but it does really make sense to at least scope out the data in the knowledge graph dashboard first before diving into other applications. So. If you want to uh, follow along, you can head to app.diffbot.com and uh, you can you can log in. Uh, where we're going to head uh, is to Knowledge Graph Search to get started. Um, and I'm going to very briefly sketch out the basics of how you search in the KG. Then I'll jump into specific queries useful to market intel. So first off, you search and filter through the KG with something called Diffbot Query Language. Uh, there's also a visual query builder, which is a great way to start. But if you're regularly using the KG, you want to at least familiarize yourself with how Diffbot Query Language works. And the Visual Query Builder gives you a preview of how you would write the same query in DQL, um, which is helpful for learning. So the basics are that you start with an entity type. Um, like we mentioned, these include organizations, articles, people, products, events, uh, all of these entity types on the screen right now. Uh, but once you've selected an entity type, um, this is the most general search you can make. And uh, note, as I mentioned, you can preview what the DQL would look like. In this case, just type colon organization. Uh, but if I click search, this returns all org entities in the knowledge graph. So about 246 million of them, which is pretty cool, but it's also way too much data for any particular market intel um, use case. So the way you narrow down an initial declaration of type colon organization is you uh, filter by fields. Uh, you can toggle to select a field. And uh, so, you know, a very basic query could look something like uh, looking at all of the orgs in an industry um, or any of these other fields you can start to toggle by. Um, you know, as an example, let's say, let's say we want to find all shoe brands in Canada. So oh, we can do industries, shoe brands, and then location, country name, Canada. Um, click search. And at the present moment, it looks like there are about 6,100 shoe brands in Canada. And this is just a random search. But even here, you can see that there's probably not a comparable list of these organizations anywhere on the public web. Yes, they're public web data, um, but they aren't structured anywhere else. So uh, these 6.1K organizations all meet 
um, this criteria, uh, but they're also all explorable. So if I click on Aldo group uh, and let that load, uh, we can start to see a great deal of firmographic data right off the bat, all sourced from the public web. So it has number of employees, uh, the date it was founded, subsidiaries, industries, key people, their recent uh, social media posts, the technologies used in their websites, as well as articles where they have been uh, tagged by our NLP. Uh, and just to note, this, this in and of itself is just an abbreviated view. Um, so if we go to JSON and look at the extended JSON, uh, there are actually many more fields. So let me search for, here's one that was not on the uh, visual page called explicit origin. And, uh, and essentially explicit, explicit origin is just where we actually found that fact originally, whatever fact is being, being referenced here. Um, and again, note that, you know, as I mentioned, different, different uh, entity types uh, do have different values. So if we head down here to these article entities, uh, I click through to uh, this article about the Gucci heirs. Uh, and yes, it, it's related because it mentions the Aldo group. Um, we can see that article entities have an entirely different set of fields. Um, we have publisher information, extracted topical tags, uh, quotes, and yet again, just to highlight the point, this is not all of the fields. We can go to extended JSON and in this case, uh, a non-visual field with sentiment. So here we have uh, the sentiment for the document as a whole. And here we have the sentiment of each one of the topical tags in context. So for example, the entity Ridley Scott was mentioned somewhere in this article uh, in a not very favorable way. Uh, sentiment ranges from negative one, very negative to one, very positive. Um, in these fields would, again, you know, they differ on product or person pages. Um, and so, you know, as you learn more about the knowledge graph, you can determine how best to approach a given data type. You can find uh, person entities linked to within an organization, like we saw in the Aldo group. Uh, but you can also just filter through all person entities that have a single employer, uh, different routes to similar data, and depending on your choice of entity type uh, that you want returned, you'll have a different set of facts that are attached to that entity. So that's what I'm going to show in our uh, next example. So um, we're going to head back out to search. And in this case, we can do all of this in the visual query editor. I'm going to say, uh, let's see, let's try to find all current Microsoft employees that uh, are skilled at machine learning. So we can go employments, employer name. Microsoft employments is current true skills name machine learning. And uh, notice how it populates our DQL query. So you can sort of start to familiarize yourself with it. It's this first field that really dictates what you're going to have returned. So in this case, person entities. Um, and in this, this case, we have 14,600 people returned, um, which is pretty cool. They're all they all people that presently work at Microsoft and uh, somewhere publicly online, it's been noted that they are skilled at machine learning or worked in machine learning. So um, how would we explore this data a bit more within the knowledge graph visual interface? So one thing we could do is we could facet, which is essentially a summary view. Um, so our initial, this is the, our initial pool of individuals we're looking at, but let's say we wanted to see where they're based. Uh, we can do facet colon, uh, location, city, name. Um, and this may seem a little foreign if you've been using the visual query editor, but all these fields you can choose from are in the documentation and you'll definitely start to pick them up over, over time. And so this is probably what we expected. Um, you know, most machine learning uh, talent for Microsoft are based in Washington State, where they're headquartered, or San Francisco. Um, but we can we can swap out Facet for almost any field. So, like, let's see, let's check another one out. Um, let's see what additional skills these individuals have. These machine learning experts. Um, in this case, machine learning is number one. That's our initial pool. Um, and that, you know, that makes sense. 
Uh, you know, some of these, it's likely that many of these individuals have graduate degrees. So maybe they uh, were TAs or taught at some point. Mathematics makes sense. You know, but you also sometimes exploring in this way found find outliers. So economics is pretty high on the list. Maybe that means Microsoft tries to hire individuals with a fintech background. Um, but you can basically perform this type of facet query to get a, get a quick view of data that's returned, uh, show you what you might want to mine into more. So on to our next type of query, I want to show you a somewhat new query type that's called uh, similar to. Um, this is this is basically where we have all of these facts on, on hundreds of millions of org entities. And uh, so we've provided a metric on the scale of zero to one regarding how similar organiz organizations are um, to each other. Um, this may look a little obscure at this point. We're saying we want organizations returned and we want them to be similar to the organization whose name is Walmart, just as a sample query. Let's just wait for this. Here we are. Okay, came through. Um, so yeah, and so you get these resu results returned. One thing worth noting as you explore the um, the visual interface more is, uh, you know, this is a summary view. Uh, this is like a search results page. So like, how would you sort of sample um, the data that you're actually looking at here? So you can export it uh, JSON or CSV. I'm going to go to the CSV export screen, and. Um, to, so we can actually see this value that is potentially useful. We're seeing it used more called similarity score. Uh, similarity score is essentially um, a metric that is between zero and one. The closer to one you are, the more similar you are to another organization. Um, and so when this loads, oh, similarity score it should populate the right of here. And so we can see like, uh, you know, Safeway is considered quite similar to Walmart uh, across all the fact types we have. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, Rite Aid is like, is, is somewhat, somewhat similar, but not nearly as much. Um, and by default, similar to queries return 25 most similar organizations. Um, but we can also, uh, we can also mine in a bit more. We could point this lens of similar to at a totally different collection of organizations. So like, I'm going to back back out and let's say we wanted to know who the quote unquote Walmart of sporting good retailers is. So we can essentially just insert one phrase here where we say return organizations that have the industry sporting good retailers and that are similar to Walmart. And it sort, sort of tracks here. We have these big box stores, Dick Sporting Goods, Hibbit Sports, you know, uh, Polish and Malaysian chains uh, as well. So the similar to query can be used both to really highlight potential partners or competitors or a market segment, sort of that first use I showed that had Safeway and Whole Foods, um, or it could be used uh, within an, like to show a, only a somewhat related field, uh, organizations that share characteristics with one another, the Tesla of X, the, you know, however you'd like to phrase that. Um, Sort of a related query is also to return all organizations that meet a certain criteria and then to facet by that same criteria. So in this case, uh, we want all organizations returned that are manufacturing, and then we want to facet by their industry. So you're showing some like co-occurrence co here. So we can see uh, personal care and products, manu manufacturers and soap and cosmetics are the most common. Uh, type of manufacturing firms, followed by uh, building materials, ceramics, and then manufacturers who were also retailers. Um, so yeah, our next technique I wanted to show is how to detect whether an entity has a value for a given fact type. Uh, so not all organizations, say, have funding rounds um, or co-founders or what have you. So this is a really simple one. Um, you just declare your your uh, type of entity you want returned, and it just has colon, and then whatever field you want to ensure uh, is in the results. Uh, so in this case, which orgs have revenue? And it looks like 245 million entities are returned that have revenue. Um, 
which is almost all the orgs in the KG. And th this sort of leads us to another technique that, that people wanted to hear about. Um, and this is a field we've improved in recent days. We've always had revenue if a company is publicly listed and release an earning report, and we still extract data directly from those earning reports if a company is uh, offers that data publicly. But what we've added here is machine machine learning model that estimates revenue for private organizations that don't publicly list their revenue. Um, so let's see if we can see how this would work in an industry that's commonly um, privately held businesses, so like law law firms. Um, and it says we have about 1.9 million law firms. Uh, and so let's, let's pop over to CSV again, sort of another technique just to see what, what is the data being returned. And, you know, you might consume this data programmatically or in Excel sheets, uh, but this just helps to sort of briefly mine in if you're in the dashboard. And so like, let's see if this tracks like, uh, $1.6 billion in revenue, uh, for this multinational law firm. This is one of the biggest law firms in the world. So yeah, it sort of, sort of tracks. We should also note that we also have um, historical revenue. So yearly revenue values, and this will be returned if it's there as an array. Uh, and that commonly, um, across the KG, that's commonly when it's a publicly traded company and we have years of data to draw on. Or if they're just, say, articles we can infer or characteristics about them we can infer um, for uh, private revenue. So um, let me check any questions. No questions right now. Um, next, I want to pop over to article entities. Uh, in particular, for Market Intel, I sort of want to pull out two, uh, two field types. So uh, for articles, I would say those two most important fields are uh, your tags. These are uh, NLP generated uh, topical tags, and then uh, sentiment. And from this from from this view in the KG, sentiment is the sentiment of the document as a whole. Um, and so this could be good to track sentiment over around a topic over time. Uh, a given tag, a tag can be a corporation. A tag can be um, a, a more abstract concept, uh, you know, sort of any entity that recurs over time in articles. Um, so let's look at an at example. Let's say, um, let's say we only want articles tagged uh, Microsoft. And uh, let's say we just want to start by getting sort of a big picture view. So we can facet by sentiment. And if we look through these results, we can see they're in sort of these buckets, at least in this facet form. Um, we can see the most prevalent categories 0.75 to 1, so very positive, followed by the inverse, quite negative, followed by three pretty large categories that are positive. So, so articles about Microsoft tend to be relatively positive. And in this case, many of these articles, if you scroll down, you can see there are hundreds of thousands of articles that reference uh, Microsoft. Um, and you can get more of a sort of newsfeed view if then you pop out of facet, um, which is sort of in this case, uh, in this case, starting from the past, it looks like uh, maybe working forward has sentiment on there. But let's let's mix this up a little bit. Um, so let's try to find uh, let's try to find all articles from roughly the last month that were published in China about Microsoft. And uh, th this sort of highlights a few market Intel related points uh, right here, um, which, which uh, you know, includes the fact that this is a global unsiloed news index. And also that, uh, that our topical tags, our NLP can, can process every major language essentially. So topical tags works here to say, hey, these are these are articles about Microsoft and here's the sentiment. Sort of interesting, Microsoft had positive sentiment overall, but uh, oh, that's only on the seventh. Let's do after, let's get a little bigger, a little bigger sample. But yeah, largely, largely very negative sentiment, interesting. Um, 
to quickly jump through a few more article type queries. Um, we should highlight the or selector. So this is like a really, this, is, this can be a very quick way to create your own sort of dashboard about competitors or vendors, or let's, you know, let's say you have 10 organizations you're interested in. And it's like, okay, I want articles that are in the index about Microsoft Teams or Facebook Workplace. And here are 36,000 of them. Um, good way to build out a solid news feed quickly. Uh, also should note that you can get a listing of elements within articles, uh, sort of similar to how we faceted around skills for people. So um, let's look at all time. So this is one of our article fields where we have quotes uh, that are extracted and then individual speakers. And so these are uh, the most circulated Joe Biden quotes in our article index. Um, and if you if you click through to them, then they have, this is basically like a retweet count for the entire web. This is, for this particular Joe Biden quote, I ask everyone to stay calm, the process is working. Um, it looks like it has been in 409 separate articles. Uh, and you can click through sort of any of those, any of those facets. Um, and, if you want to play around with this sort of market intel sort of news feed uh, like data, I would recommend actually trying out, uh, this is a new demo page we set up. Uh, it's at diffbot.com slash solutions news monitoring feed. And it's a very beginner friendly way to make a structured news feed where you can pull in like custom events like acquire, merge, partnership, as well as a list of uh, companies and get global, global re results. Um, so I guess th thus far, we've been working through these sort of exploratory queries. Uh, in the end, many of these queries get wrapped up in a dashboard or used programmatically or pulled into an analysis tool. So these fields do become combined, transformed, or presented you know, in useful ways. Um, so I like to think of these types of queries as sort of building blocks and initial validations that there is data there. And whether you're looking for a custom solution from DiffBot or or you're just baking this data into your dashboard as one among many sources, um, playing around in the KG is a great starting point. But to show sort of a, to show sort of a more finished, uh, this data integrated into something, I'm gonna hop over to a custom demo dashboard. Uh, this is one we built for a fitness software company called MindBody. And this dashboard combines knowledge graph data with custom crawls in our NL API. Um, but a, good deal of this data is also available in some form within the knowledge graph as well. So here we basically have a news feed for all the competitors and customers within this industry. Um, we've pulled out custom topical tags, so like acquisition, investment, um, these different these different custom activities, and we've pulled out modalities, so it's fitness, so you know, gymnastics or cycling. Um, and this lets us sort of cut to the heart of there are these the, the co-occurrence in these tags that are already in knowledge graph entities. So we can see there's an article about yoga and high intensity interval training. Um, and there's been an acquisition in that space. Um, and, you know, as I, as I mentioned, these are all things that can be found in some form in the KG. So we can find, uh, say, news mentions of the entire industry here, but simply by changing what um, entities we want returned, you can easily build out a customer news page uh, as well, which is the second tab. We have a count of the mentions. There could alternatively be any of the KG fields uh, that we're tracking here. Um, like, for example, if you jump, jump down to a competitor like Virtua Gym, um, you know, this has, uh, this has hiring trends directly from the knowledge graph. So are there more or less person entities that have an is current employer value of Virtua Gym uh, over time? Um, you can also have these sort of aggregate counts like, um, like uh, what's the velocity of their news mentions? And uh, then what is the sentiment of those same news mentions over time? And this can obviously be pointed at any industry that has coverage online, but the main point I'm trying to get across is, is that when you start building off these basic knowledge graph queries, you can pretty quickly get to a point where you have a really informative dashboard for monitoring an entire industry. And this dashboard could have been made in Google Sheets as well, or the data pulled into Tableau or Power BI or what have you. Um, 
So yeah, that's what we have prepared for our market intel centered webinar. I'm gonna I'm gonna stick around for a few more minutes, and please let me know if anybody has any questions or comments. And uh, thank you all so much.